Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's afternoon where I am. Uh, we still have some people registering. My name's Leanne Close and I'll be emceeing the event today. Uh, but I'm conscious of the time and that we only have an hour with you today. So we might get started and other people will be able to catch up as we go along. I'd like to welcome all of our registered attendees today to this uh, cyber and infrastructure webinar. We, uh, this is our first in a series of webinars in relation to cyber and infrastructure security. And our guest speaker for today's webinar is Hamish Hansford. Uh, Hamish is the head of Australia's Cyber and Infrastructure Security Centre at the Department of Home Affairs. And I'll do a, uh, a, a more in-depth bio into, um, introduction to Hamish shortly. Uh, but as we begin, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. Uh, both Hamish and I are based in Canberra, and so we're on Ngunnawal country. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging leaders. I uh, also acknowledge that because we've got attendees from right across Australia from a range of organisations uh, that you're coming to us from various First Nation countries uh, as well. So as I said, my name's Leanne Close and I'm the Chief Executive for Government and Strategy at Risk to Solution Group. I also sit on a range of boards, both government, not-for-profit and some audit and risk committees. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police and, and worked for the Federal Police for over 33 years. Uh, as well as that, I had 12 months at the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department and, and uh, uh, Hamish and I have known each other over many years as well. Hamish is um, a distinguished, distinguished public sector um, senior executive and uh, has been the head of the uh, Australian Cyber and Infrastructure Security Centre since the 1st of September 2021. He's the inaugural head of, of that centre. Uh, the centre itself has regulatory responsibilities in relation to aviation, maritime, uh, offshore gas, oil security, telecommunications, but also a much broader range of critical infrastructure uh, organisations across Australia, as Hamish will um, attest to and talk about shortly where the legislation was extended. Uh, prior to this role, Hamish has worked in a range of really critical government um, entities, including as uh, the first assistant secretary for cyber, digital and technology policy division. Uh, and in that role, Hamish implemented Australia's cyber security strategy for 2020, a really key policy document for us. He's also worked across a range of other key government agencies, including the Department of Immigration and Border Protection, the Australian Crime Commission. He's worked in key roles in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Attorney General's Department, uh, and assisting the Australian Senate at certain points as well. So Hamish, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Leanna, and great to see you again and, and thanks for, for doing this session with me. Uh, it's a pleasure. So just a quick little bit of context for our audience members in relation to why we're um, focused on this. We really um, are keen for Hamish for you to give us a bit of an introduction about the centre, the role, the key priorities that you're working on, because we know there's been a raft of legislative change. Um, but just I think one of the um, key lessons for all of us right now, every day we're seeing issues relating to um, attacks, breaches, uh, other um, problems, whether it's malicious or inadvertent is um, issues affecting our critical infrastructure, our organisations. Certainly, just even in recent days, we've seen uh, issues affecting our telecommunications area in Australia. Uh, globally, we've seen attacks on critical infrastructure with the Nord Stream sabotage. Uh, even um, regionally in Australia, we've seen uh, a couple of um, security breaches at some of our two major airports uh, that had big flow on effects for the whole infrastructure and the whole network across Australia um, just this week. So what, what we know that we need to speak about today is talking about have our organisations got that right risk management approach and culture within our organisations. What do we need to do to be better prepared? What do we need to have that integrated management approach to it? Uh, for us, it's not just about focusing on compliance, although compliance is important, and resilience, bouncing back. We term it as um, pre-resilience, so having um, effective planning mechanisms where we focus on a whole integrated ecosystem around risk management. And so that's some of the things we really would like to touch on today with you. Uh, but right now, I'd love to um, open up the floor to Hamish to just give it that introduction of um, your key role, what the centre's priorities are, and issues that you know our audience will be interested in hearing about. 
Thanks. Well, thanks very much, Leanne. A lot to discuss over the next hour, and I'm so glad so many people have tuned in um, for this lunchtime session, well, our lunchtime. And really, um, my um, Cyber and Infrastructure Security Centre has two main roles, and they're, they're quite distinct. One is a, a, is a regulatory authority uh, for all of the issues that Leanne spoke about, but perhaps the um, more high level role is really talks about critical infrastructure protection coordination. So really our role is the protection of infrastructure across Australia. We're interested in the security outcome and, and to try and create in its best place, um, the most secure infrastructure in the world and to really have a sense that Australia is a hard target for some of those threats that Leanne spoke about. In order to do that, we've, we've um, got both a regulatory responsibility, but also this really important coordination responsibility, which we hope has industry learning from industry, both across sectors and between sectors, and really having the government use its convening power to bring like-minded stakeholders together. Because when you, you boil it down, the, the role of the government and the role that we look at is in terms of national risk, and really looking at systemic responses to um, the individual attacks that you might see on a day-to-day -day basis or incidents that might occur, and really looking at how do we protect Australia nationally. And so, so that's really the overwhelming focus and priority. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been speaking to many of you about risk management program obligations and different obligations, but I think today um, I'm really taking the role as a critical infrastructure protection coordinator and an educator and, uh, and a linker as the most important um, area of focus, and I'm very much keen to talk to you today. Thanks so much, Hamish. Um, just a reminder for our audience members in the Q&A function, you can um, pop your questions in there. Now, we have got a lot of people and we'll try to endeavour to get to as many of those as possible. Uh, I might start with just a, a couple myself, though, Hamish. We saw recently in a survey that was undertaken um, uh, just actually a few weeks before the Optus breach, that only half of Australia's board directors believe their company may fall victim to a cyber attack within the next 12 months. Um, that survey also highlighted that we're lagging in awareness of um, systemic cyber risk compared to many other countries. And, and I probably suspect that survey may be a little bit different if we ran that now with um, the significant uh, media attention that the Optus breach got. So um, I know, Hamish, you've been dealing with it. And I don't want to go into any of those sort of specifics, but for our audience, what are some of those sort of key issues that have been identified at this early stage that you think need to be a priority for other critical infrastructure owner operators? Yeah, I think Australia has been on a journey for the last four years, which commenced um, in in the, the finalisation of the first Security of Critical Infrastructure Act in 2018 that defined infrastructure objectively quite narrowly um, for utilities and, and ports in Australia. By the time we got to Australia's 2020 cyber security strategy, the overwhelming issue we were hearing from industry and from infrastructure providers is around individual management of risk, but more importantly, the interconnected nature of how infrastructure is connected to everything else and the way in which both society is developing, but infrastructure is developing, the need to have a, a much more holistic framework for the protection of infrastructure. So that's why um, the, the parliament has now legislated for a much more expansive definition of infrastructure. And then really thinking about how do we develop the, the best principles based um, settings and framework that the government can provide that, that framework for action. And, and really, I think Leanne, when you, you quoted the survey, one of the things we were very minded to do is um, hear from security managers, chief risk officers, CISOs, and people who are trying to get the attention of their CEOs and boards. And we've we've designed a risk management program obligation in, in the critical infrastructure reforms that we're consulting on at the moment out to, to mid-November, um, really designed for companies to have the framework to look at risk holistically. Time and time again, I talk to a whole range of infrastructure providers and they have different elements given um, individual histories that are particular strengths, but looking at it as a, a set of obligations about managing risk. And from our perspective, looking at the full range of all hazard risks is something we think the government can contribute to by setting that framework um, and, and looking at how do you do systemic risk management across each of the different hazards, whether that's environmental or 
personal or social or other related things that might impact on the business. And from the, the critical infrastructure perspective, we're really interested in those material hazards or those those significant risk events that might impact the functioning of an infrastructure entity. And Leanne, you mentioned um, the security incidences at airports um, and and their, their physical related um, issues and, and airports across Australia have for at least since um, 2003 had, had a whole range of regulatory settings in place and there's always room to, to learn from some of the events that have happened. But I think that the big thing that's coming down on um, all of us, both in government and, and infrastructure providers, is the, the cyber threat and particularly supply chain threats and the, the impact that a single event might have. Um, and really thinking about the nightmare solution of waking up in the morning and realising that a ransomware attacks occurred or you don't have control of an asset and, and what do you do about it. And now I guess is the time to think about how do we prepare for those events and how, how do we start to put in place the preventative mechanisms? And if they do eventuate, how do we respond effectively? So I think that's that's the overwhelming story of infrastructure over the last couple of years and, and consequently then the focus that we, we should collectively have. Thanks, Hamish. And I see we've got one question there in relation to telcos and their exemption from critical infrastructure obligations. Um, I think it'd be great for you to give us an insight that the obligations um, and list of critical infrastructure entities has actually expanded in, in the last 12 months. That, that, that's right. So from um, December of 2021, telecommunications um, assets uh, are in um, the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act um, as a definition. And, and so as part of the communications sector, I think what uh, the question alludes to is that the three positive security obligations um, that can apply to critical infrastructure um, are, are not do not apply at the moment to telecommunications assets. The, the reason why that is the case is uh, that the, the government, the current government, switched on two of the obligations under the Telecommunications Act, mandatory cyber incident reporting and provision of information into the, the register of critical infrastructure assets under the Telecommunications Act. And um, for, for a number of years now, telecommunications providers have had obligations to do their best to, to prevent unauthorised interference or uh, to prevent against criminal activity from occurring on telecommunications carriers or carriage service providers under the Telecommunications Act. I think the Minister for Home Affairs in some of her comments um, subsequent to um, the Optus um, incident um, said that the government is minded to have a look at whether or not those settings are fit for purpose and, and that's, that's the work that, that we're undertaking now. Thanks, Hamish. Um, and you touched on this a little bit, but just wondering if we can go into sort of some of those really key challenges. You, you um, mentioned that this isn't just about cyber risk. The legislation, the framework is around all of those key risks in relation to people managing their, their digital assets, data, information, uh, physical assets as well, supply chain, uh, and that really important one around personnel, which we all know that um, people are the key to having really effective risk management processes in place. So what are some of those ones that you've seen at that strategic level from the centre are the real risks? Yeah, I think um, we really view risk in, in, a, in the context of material risk. So, so when you think about it, there are a whole range of things that can materially impact the functioning of infrastructure and, and, and you're right Leanne that it's from a whole range of different perspectives. There has been a, a big focus at the moment on network security, cyber security, information security and, and rightly so it's a it's an increasing uh, problem with um, one cyber report reported every eight minutes um, and that's just what's reported. Um, which is co coincidentally why we've tried to put a mandatory cyber incident reporting regime in place to understand the, the true nature of cyber events. But I think if you look at network and, and cyber security and, and you adhere either to the essential eight or the NIST framework, then, then that's one element. Um, looking then at whether or not there's uh, appropriate uh, people who can have access to secure parts of an infrastructure provider, really looking at trusted insiders or malicious actors from within is, is another area. And when you look at some of the successful cyber incidents, personnel um, related vulnerabilities feature pretty highly in, in the enablement of some of those cyber events um, um, unwittingly. 
Um, but the, the nightmare scenario is really a trusted insider acting maliciously from within, including those um, who have left a business and, and those who take confidential and sensitive information with them. So you're right, personnel security remains a, a high particular issue and, and threat. Physical security, um, so, some highly regulated sectors, and, and I know airports very well, uh, have for many years looked at physical security. I think the, the attacks that are, are happening um, both from vandalism but also from threat actors means physical security becomes much more important if you're thinking about the protection of the crown jewels of infrastructure or things that materially make it operate. And then um, I think uh, cyclones and, and extreme weather events and I can hear the wind above me at the moment in Canberra um, beating down on the building are becoming uh, much more frequent in the, the current weather season and thinking about natural hazards and, and how they might impact on uh, a business are, are increasingly important. And then finally, um, supply chain. Uh, and, and we saw throughout COVID-19 the stress on supply chains and the impact that um, particular shortages of products have or, or particular control of supply chain with single vendors or, or particular issues can then have a consequential impact on the functioning of society. I mean, I only need to mention AdBlue as a, a diesel additive to think about the impact that that has on the functioning of freight across Australia, just to take one example. So when, when you look at each of those different hazards from our perspective, we look at, at national risk and, and how they might um, eventuate. And the best examples that we see of people looking at um, infrastructure security and, and risk management is considering each of those um, different elements and how they might materially impact on an infrastructure provider. And, and really the, the best best case is where it's done holistically and together and had an, have an integrated approach. But I think um, the, the nightmare situation from our point of view is we wake up tomorrow and a particular infrastructure provider that we all rely on and, and, and thought was there um, providing gas or electricity or water or um, making us communicate or, or really um, making the economy function isn't there anymore. And, and that's something that's foremost on our minds when we think about national risk. Thanks, Hamish. I'll go to um, Osman's question where he's um, talking about the risk management obligations as they relate to critical assets. Uh, however, he's saying a definition of critical assets not provided. And, and what is um, your view around the definition of a critical asset as it relates to the uh, Security of Critical Infrastructure Act? Well, um, I, there, there are 11 different sectors um, in the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act, and, and then there are 22 different classes of critical infrastructure yeah. assets. So if you ever need help um, finding uh, your particular definition, um, then they're, they're all um, located in the Act or in a subordinate um, instrument, which uh, narrows the rules in, in, narrows the definitions in some cases. But um, if you're having trouble finding the critical infrastructure asset definition, then we're very keen to help. But I, I just wanted to maybe just give you a sense about how we've approached um, the, the asset definitions. And I think um, a really good example is um, the health and medical um, sector. So a broad sector that includes GPs, pharmacists, a whole range of things that are particularly important to the health of Australians. The, the particular critical infrastructure asset that underpins that sector to which obligations can apply is a hospital with a functioning ICU, um, as defined in the legislation that we're, we're working with the hospital sector at the moment um, to, to try and, and narrow that even further to really focus on the truly critical hospitals which underpin, underpin acute care in, in Australia and working with those hospitals on risk management and the security of the functioning of um, things that Australians rely on, particularly in times of a, a global pandemic or um, a foot and mouth uh, outbreak or, or other things that might impact um, Australians. Yeah, thanks for that. And we had um, a question about non-compliance. What are the consequences of that? And how does an organisation know um, that they've reached the level of reasonably practicable um, when the entity is quite different in size and scope for each of the um, CI assets. Yeah, we, we thought in, in designing uh, the risk management program that the worst thing you could do as a government is design something where the government has to approve it. Because I think the, the premise to the question is, 
infrastructure knows how to run infrastructure best and we're great that, that you know your business um, better than we ever will. Um, and, and that's why the obligation is to have a risk management program to comply with it, to review it and to update it. And then to get your board or governing authority to sign off or, or attest that the risk management program is in place um, annually. And that our role then as a, a national coordinator, a national regulator is, is really to look at um, how do we build the capacity of Australian infrastructure to look at risk management and, and to work out how we can provide a, a best service to improve the management of risk for all infrastructure with the, the ultimate aim that I started with at the beginning of creating the, a safe and secure set of infrastructure and a harder target for threat actors in Australia and, and hopefully be the, the best infrastructure and, and most secure infrastructure in the world. So that, if that's the overarching premise of our work, we're interested in security outcomes. However, there, there will be times though where there is either, um, either blatant um, non-compliance or deliberate non-compliance. And, and to be completely truthful, there are powers uh, under the um, regulatory powers um, of the Commonwealth to enable uh, effective responses. We're not going to go in and say, we, we think you've got as far as practicable wrong. We're looking at, do you have a risk management program? Are you complying with it? Are you updating it over time? But our, our role over the next couple of years is really just to educate and inform and to help and be a really supportive um, regulatory authority to try and improve our baseline risk in Australia. And then really looking in the out years on um, serious non-compliance. Um, but, but even then really uh, starting from the premise of education, awareness, engagement, and then only very much focused on um, serious non-compliance. And, and where that occurs, um, my, my approach will be to engage um, with the most senior parts of businesses um, to try and raise awareness because if we're issuing infringements, we've, we've almost failed because uh, if our outcome is security and not compliance, we, we really want to see self-compliance and self-regulation um, because our interest is in security. And, and I think the final point for me is that's why we've purposely kept the infringement regime as very low um, in objectively in, in the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act. You don't see millions of dollars worth of infringements. You see uh, the maximum infringement of 200 penalty units, which is about $44,000. So, so that's that's the approach that we've um, both conceived of and we'll, we'll seek to undertake. Thanks for that. And I know that you and the team have been involved in a lot of town halls. There's a lot of information on the website as well where people can go and, and uh, get some information that it helps their particular organisation um, and keep that conversation going with the centre. Um, one of the questions we've got here is that uh, they've heard that Telecommunications Act usurps the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act and the obligations are regarding cybersecurity is less in that and they're keen to just have a quick comment on that from you, Hamish. Sure. So, so there are three parts to the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act um, aside from the definition. So the first point to make is, um, as I said, telecommunications um, providers are critical infrastructure in the definition. It's true that none of the three uh, positive security obligations apply to telecommunications um, providers, carriers or carriage service providers, but they, they are treated in different ways in the Telecommunications um, Act 1997, including relevantly part 14 of that act is, a, is effectively um, the, the obligation, which is similar to, but it is certainly not equivalent to the risk management program obligation. Um, so that's the, the first part of the act. The second part is um, the declaration of systems of national significance to which enhanced cybersecurity obligations apply. Uh, and the Minister for Home Affairs has declared 82 systems of national significance um, and, and telecommunications assets are available to be declared systems of national significance. The, the, actual, um, the actual systems of national significance, the individual companies are not not named, they're, they're private for security reasons, but, but they're in scope, they're available to be applied to telecommunications um, providers. And then the final part of the, the act, which is if everything goes wrong and there is a cyber incident and there is no other regulatory regime that could enable an effective response, that applies to all infrastructure assets, including telecommunications assets. So I think that's the more comprehensive response um, that there are three parts of the act. Um, two, two of the three apply to telecommunications 
um, assets or can apply to telecommunications assets. Um, but, but always we've looked at if there's regulatory duplication, we're trying to set a baseline of risk in the economy uh, for critical infrastructure, and we don't seek to duplicate existing regulations. The question then is, well, are those regulations fit for purpose? And I think the government's um, made some public statements on that. Thanks, Hamish. Um, the next couple of questions are um, around case studies and whether there's case studies available um, in relation to, I guess, really good examples of how um, organisations, critical infrastructure assets in Australia are managing um, their risk uh, and particularly, I guess, lessons learnt from breaches and, and um, other incidents that you're seeing and, and other Commonwealth, ag Commonwealth organisations are seeing. Yeah, sure. So I think um, given we've we've been in operation for 13 months and we're we're constantly populating our website and and, and uh, collaborating with you on the trusted information sharing network, um, I, I think the short answer is there's, there's still a lot of work to do and we're very keen to, to provide some of those case studies. But let me just describe to you some of the things that are available today. The first thing is a lot of our fact sheets, particularly um, the more detailed fact sheets on the mandatory cyber incident reporting, do go through different case studies around what what cyber incidents um, uh, can and, and have occurred in, in the in different infrastructure providers and gives you a sense about different thresholds for each of the sectors the critical infrastructure sectors on our website we have a risk assessment that risk assessment gives you a sense about the environment that uh, that particular sector operates in and it does try and distill some of the key learnings uh, and some of the key threats and 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 consequently the the areas for mitigation at a sector level, so they're, they're new in the last um, month or so that we've we've been developing over the last year, which gives you a, a macro view of each individual sector, and, and and particularly I think relevant in the context of developing a risk management program, and then um, finally I think uh, that as I started with, um, we're very keen to partner with individual companies who have faced some of the the most significant risks, um, particularly cyber incidents or physical breaches or trusted insiders. And we've had conversations over the last month or so with those who have been um, impacted in a whole range of different ways. We're trying to develop best practice guidance around here's what we've learned from the experience and 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 here's what we um, collectively can learn. And I think that's the, the area that you'll see next, in addition to some of the exercises that we're running with individual companies and or with state and territory governments. Um, so many learnings that we're very keen to distill and share. And then um, the, the final, final point, I know I said finally, but the final, final point is um, for those 82 systems of national significance, um, we've voluntarily asked for a copy of um, all of their incident response plans. And we're, we're going through those incident response plans to say, what does good look like? Where, where, where are areas that we see uh, particular areas of strength? Where are areas that we collectively look at to, um, to see where there might be objective improvement as a way to, particularly for those systems of national significance to really think about incident response. And I know many, many people look at other incidents that happen to other companies and, and think what would happen if that's me? And, and we're very keen to, to try and facilitate some of those conversations. Thanks for that. Um, on a slightly different topic, but one that's quite relevant because we're about to run the Protective Security and Government Conference next week, we had a question um, in relation to the risk management program where um, the centre has used terms around all hazards risk management, and you touched on that again earlier around, around environmental risks, etc., disaster management. Um, so the question is around um, the difference between that and protective security terminology in risk management. Um, is it helpful or a hindrance? Do you see differences, similarities? I think um, that that we we listened to the concerns of industry and came up with all hazards and material risk to try and and set a principles based set of regulations, and and, and really if you're thinking about national regulation across multiple sectors as a, a baseline for the economy for infrastructure, you can't be prescriptive. You, you've got to be able to make um, principles based regulation that can adhere to a hospital or a, an electricity company or a gas supplier or distributor or a, a communications provider. Um, and so that's the approach we've taken. 
so, some of the the more detailed guidance um, is much more prescriptive, and so some of the, for example, prudential standards that APRO manage um, are, are quite um, prescriptive and appropriate for financial institutions. Same thing with the uh, protective security policy framework for the government has a greater level of um, specific information and, and requirements um, that that is appropriate to different scenarios. Uh, I guess if you're acting nationally and looking at, act, at national risk, the, the balance that we've formed is principles around all hazards and thinking broadly about what might impact and not just from a security perspective, but from an all hazards, broad security perspective, that's the approach that, that we've really thought would be the best for the nation. Um. And getting back to our critical infrastructure owners and operators, one of the questions is around have, what sort of um, challenge you found for the CEOs and boards in relation to security, um, both cyber and physical, they're asking. So is it around commitment of funds or resources? Is it understanding? What insights have you got in relation to CEOs and boards? Well, I think it, it depends on, on the infrastructure provider. I'm not trying to um, get out of the answer, but it really does depend because a lot of the, the um, focus of a, an industry provider inherently has some risks which which appear to be the most important um, at a particular time. So, for example, if you're a, an aviation um, participant or an infrastructure provider and, and airline safety, you're trying to fly an aircraft or manage an airport, um, safety appears extremely highly. Um, our view is safety and security are co-equal threats. But you have a natural inclination to think about safety because you, you think about um, providing safe and secure services. I think the maturity of companies to then think well and and actually think much more broadly around and what are what are the networks that underpin that that um, function? What are the people that actually contribute to the functioning of my particular service? What are what would happen if um, something happened and, and there was a storm. I think that, that it depends on the industry or infrastructure provider. There are natural strengths and, and, and really well-known risks, but I think the challenge for um, board members, for CEOs and, and for those managing infrastructure is the range of risks and threats are increasing and that is challenging to try and think about um, risk generally, security generally and in a much broader way. And, and one of the, the key areas that I, I really see time and time again and I see actually a, an industry develop around in support which probably gets to your um, alluded point around complexity is people might think about their cyber security and, and protect their systems but then um, think about their suppliers and I was speaking to a particular company the other day that had a, a thousand and twenty different suppliers that they, they're starting to do due diligence on in terms of their cyber maturity. So the weakest link in an, in, in an industry provider and a weakest link in a network may well be a supplier. And so, so I think that that's the increasing complexity of the threats that we face um, it is really challenging for us nationally, for infrastructure um, specifically, and for CEOs and, and boards as well. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And I won't say which course I did, but earlier this year I, I did a course that um, was particularly focused on board's role in cyber and managing that. And uh, we talked about the things, you know, the NIST and the essential aid and other things, but it, it's a complex area when you look at the whole of the risk framework. And again, depending on which organisation um, we're talking about, which entity and, and as you said, supply chains and, and third party providers and contractors. But what sort of advice, I guess, do you give to those owners and operators about the right sort of questions to ask of their chief security officers, chief risk officers, etc.? I think um, the, the best analogy is uh, you should treat security risk just like financial risk. And so boards uh, spend a lot of their time looking at um, the, the financials of a, a business or a company and put a lot of effort in uh, financial statements are audited independently. And then the same, same kind of maturity is starting to emerge over, over recent years in workplace health and safety, particularly inspired by criminal um, liability. I think the same kind of thing is starting to emerge and, and you see where cyber incidents, for example, have um, massive impact on profit and massive impact on reputation customers and staff that that cyber risk security risk should should start to feature in board discussions 
um, as a co-equal to financial and, and workplace health and safety risk, as well as all the other things that materially make infrastructure function. It does though mean that being a board member is becoming a lot more difficult. And um, I think that, that there's a, a lot of work, particularly AICD are doing to try and work with boards on, on uplift, but that's, that's gonna be an eternal challenge for board members and, and indeed for everyone supporting a CEO or, or, or the boards more generally. How do we give the best advice? How do we give options? How do we attach um, cost to some of the options and allow um, CEOs and boards to make the best um, judgment in terms of the trade-off between financial investment and um, the, the outcomes that are being sought? Couldn't agree more. And I think also the boards themselves, CEOs, looking at the mix of skill sets, mix of backgrounds of board members and, and uh, their staff so that they are getting a good range of expertise across issues where the right questions, the right issues can be focused on. Definitely, definitely. Um, so another question from Ro here um, in relation to the risk management program. Um, asking, and it goes to what we've just been talking about, I think, Hamish, asking though, will there be um, a requirement or a focus on organisations to comply with ISO standards? Um, like Essential 8 is there, and it's a good guidance. Um, it's not necessarily a full maturity model assessment, or it can be, or the NIST. Um, so yeah, what, what's your uh, guidance in relation to ISO compliance? Or yes, great, great question. So, so I started by saying um, we've gone for principles-based um, regulation or guidance um, across each of the different types of hazards except for cyber and information security risk. Given the, the way in which the, the threat environment is changing and the, the vulnerability that can emerge, we've said to uh, infrastructure providers on cyber and information security risk that with the security outcome in mind, there are some great standards or frameworks, ISO, Essential 8, NIST. From a, a regulatory perspective, we actually don't mind which regulatory, uh, which um, standard you choose, as long as it, it kind of achieves the outcome of a better cyber and information security environment. We we know that in, in dealing with the energy sector that have their own cyber related standards, multinational companies that, that use um, international standards like the NIST um, to ISO, to those who have actually um, used the essential aid as their, their foundational model, that, that or a mix of them, that actually that the outcome is security, but we do need objectively um, to have uplift across some critical infrastructure assets. Some are, are, are already meeting and exceeding the standard, st standard, which is great to see, and it is really a flaw, but we did really want to be a bit more prescriptive on cyber and information security, but equally as flexible to apply the most appropriate standard or, or requirement for your particular business. So, so that, that's the only area of greater specific requirement, but again, trying to be much more flexible. Thank you. Um, and this one's about a particular sector, and you've already touched on health sector as well earlier, Hamish, but Ivan Albertini is asking, what are the potential changes to the classification of critical health assets? Uh, and when will it be resolved? I think you've already said that mm -hmm. that have been added, obviously, as a, a critical uh, infrastructure asset for Australia. And then, um, a question probably for everybody as well, how does he get engaged in the ongoing discussions, particularly in his instance in relation to hospital classifications? So, so we have um, a dedicated discussion with hospitals right down to the individual hospitals that we're trying to capture under SOCI. Um, if you just took the definition on the face of the legislation, um, some hospital uh, providers or healthcare providers said that the, the definition is much too broad. We said that we're very happy to engage on that and to try and, and focus the definition on the most important um, hospitals that, that, that comprise our, our national network of hospitals with a, a functioning ICU and to, to not capture those very specialised um, functions, but to really think about how do we how do we define hospitals that really underpin the emergencies that people have in, in their lives and to underpin um, health and, and security. And so we're very much in that discussion uh, and, and we've I think we're we're nearing the finalisation of that definition. But um, if you haven't been involved in some of the discussions, please just send us an email and we can add you to some of those consultations um, and, and really keen to keep everyone involved. Thanks. Uh, and then Ben asks a question around um, the positive SOCI obligations, saying they're currently they currently belong with owners and operators of critical infrastructure assets. 
uh, and says there's no obligations on those who provide services to asset owners uh, and whether there's likely to be an expanded use of um, critical infrastructure asset sector assets for positive obligations. Definitely. I mean, one of the, the interesting questions I get asked a lot is it, when, when are you going to finalise implementation of SOCI? And, and the, the long answer is, uh, the short answer rather is, it, it's there to provide a, a tool to manage risk uh, forever. And so that's the long way of saying that um, the, 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 the Act is based around infrastructure assets. And so you're right that, that some of the suppliers are not captured as critical infrastructure. So because it's a bill or an act of parliament now about infrastructure assets and then those who manage them and, and own or operate them. But over time, if, if there are particular suppliers or if there are particular things which in aggregate then effectively become so important to the functioning of our society that if they were subject to a different a particular hazard from occurring, whether that's a cyber incident or a physical attack, that they would actually have a catastrophic impact or a cascading impact across the economy, then there's an ability to, to define those particular assets as critical infrastructure in one of the different sectors, uh, or, or indeed um, to think about how we might um, change the definitions over time. And when the parliament passed this, um, the final two pieces of um, or final two bills um, finalising in, in the end of March um, with Royal Assent on the 1st of April this year. They also said through the parliamentary committee process, we'd like to review um, things in a year. And so we're very much um, looking at, well, what does that review look like? Um, and what, what would we say about the first year of operations of the Act? And, and there's a lot of learnings um, in its implementation, but also in um, particular aggregate infrastructure or aggregate companies or services or providers which which might might well um, fall into the definition of critical infrastructure should the parliament wish to expand the definitions or, or indeed whether or not they could be applied and it's quite easy to add um, a critical infrastructure asset within a sector uh, 91f um, of the, the act allows the minister to to do that pretty easily um, but there's got to be a strong justification for it Thanks, Hamish. Uh, and Rebecca rightfully points out to us that the reporting deadline for new critical infrastructure assets that are captured by the Act um, ended last um, week on the 8th of October uh, and asks what are the steps now from the centre in relation to these reports? Um, should reporting entities expect a response or some sort of engagement in relation to that reporting? Yeah, so the, the register of critical infrastructure assets, um, the, the grace period ended on the 8th of October or the 7th of October for telecommunications assets. And, and um, maybe it's helpful to just give you a sense about what we do with that information. So the, we're required to keep a register of critical infrastructure for Australia. Our argument there is that if you're looking at national risk, you've got to understand two things. First of all, who owns and operates and has direct interest or has a, a, a stakeholder interest in an infrastructure asset? So effectively the who. And then the what, where is the asset located and what's the physical location of the particular asset? What do we do with that information? We, we use it to model infrastructure and particularly looking at aggregate risk and, and areas that we can provide better information and better risk advice around the types of threats that might um, materialise when you look at things nationally in aggregate or in a particular segment of the economy. We look at how um, supply chains work and, and how there might be interoperability. We also use um, the information um, in some of our risk assessments uh, for the foreign investment process given a, a national security business under the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeover Act is also um, tied to a Critical Infrastructure Act definition. So we, we provide about 900 risk assessments to um, the Treasury um, and, and to inform the Treasurers and the, uh, the decisions around financial um, investment in Australia uh, or infrastructure investment in Australia from a foreign investment perspective. And then um, we, we also use it to see whether or not um, we, we have a true understanding of infrastructure for some of the, the national policy discussions that the government is involved in, uh, particularly looking at things like the, the change in different sectors and the impact that that has and, and the, the impact of risk more generally. So um, the, the next thing you should see is better risk advice coming back your way um, uh, and, and better information once we look at things in aggregate at a national perspective. 
I said in, in saying that um, that's the only qualifier. Um, we are we are building the the register and, and really trying to understand the, the total environment um, and looking to to build out our work program in some of that advisory function back to to you for for better information. So. Um, that that's um, both appreciated for those who have complied and, and we're, we're working on it and we'll provide advice back. Oh, thanks Hamish. I think that covers as well the next question around um, how uh, the centre will engage with entities um, as the risk management program um, starts to roll out and commence. Yeah, well, we've um, we've committed on the, the parliamentary record and I'll, I'll do it again today. Um, we're, we're here to be uh, the best practice regulator for the Commonwealth. We really do aspire to, to be a collaborative um, centre and one that, that really has security in mind. So we're happy to collaborate in any way um, that we can. We, we've really um, set up the, the trust and information sharing network um, as a non-regulatory tool for us to enable that collaboration. We've got a platform based on teams so that um, industry can talk to industry, um, that we can talk about risk management and we can start to build out work programs for each of the individual trusted information sharing network working groups. We have a critical infrastructure advisory um, council, which comprises each of those sector chairs of the working groups and really thinking about how do we collaborate on, on national risk um, generally. We're, we're happy to provide um, uh, people to talk at meetings, at board meetings, at, at different functions, happy to, populate our website with more information on risk guidance and, and more, more particularised information, uh, even at a sectoral level as we move forward and, and really keen to continue the collaboration and engagement that we've had. Um, and, and so that's the long way of saying we're here to help and, and we're very much uh, see that as our, our most important. Um, thanks for that. And. Uh, a specific question there from Nigel Hornage in relation to personnel security, which is a different aspect again. Um, it's talking about Auscheck being a good start, uh, but most industri industrial standards consider training to also be proven um, to support and protect critical infrastructure. Um, and his concern is that there's um, to employ Auscheck doesn't mitigate the inadvertent insider threat. Uh, and his second part of the observation is that without a broader uptake of vetting, not all critical infrastructure operators will have access to the level of threat information that they either being asked to mitigate or would prefer to have. Uh, is there a value in establishing a, a base allowing level of vetting membership for industries and organisations more broadly? I think Hamish may have frozen, so we'll wait and see uh, if he's able to come back in for us shortly. Um, but look, first of all, I, um, as we're waiting for Hamish to come back in, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody for your questions so far. I think you'll agree with me that um, it's been a really great, broad, um, wide ranging conversation and really appreciate Hamish's um, ability to, to touch on so many key issues that affect you all. And I think Hamish is coming back in shortly. Hi Hamish, have we got you? I think you're on mute. Certainly have the answer about that. It's, it's, no, um, not at all. <laughs> Technology does us all in occasion. Communications and data providers are particularly important. They, they underpin everything. And so um, when they go down, you really notice it. Exactly. And I was asking a really long question, so I'll try to summarise it really briefly for you. But um, it was a question around personnel security and, and the upshot basically is Oz checks there and does some a part of um, checking and vetting for security personnel. Uh, but should there be an ability for critical infrastructure agencies to potentially have baseline level security clearances or vetting so that they can get that broader information to make those um, more informed risk management uh, decisions. Definitely, I think um, when, when you think about um, the the people that make up a business, uh, and and people are a core part of every infrastructure asset and, and every government agency, then um, in, in order to, to really manage insider threat, particular issues, or or really think about how do we help staff actually um, try and make our infrastructure asset the most secure that it could be, then, then constant education and engagement is a particularly important part. But knowing who you're employing and knowing their strengths and weaknesses and knowing um, in some cases their background, whether or not there's areas you've got to mitigate in terms of past criminal history or past threat 
um, I think it is particularly important. And, and you, you mentioned Auscheck. Auscheck um, is a particular service that we're offering. Um, and Auscheck check is, um, is on current figures just under $100 for major national events. And we think the, the same will be true of the critical infrastructure regime. It's a check that does um, a, an identity check, a, a criminal history check asks for an ASIO check and asks the single question about whether or not an individual is adverse to Australia's security interests. And for those who are not Australian citizens, there, also, there is also a visa check about a right to work. So we're trying to offer that service as, as four checks in one um, for under $100 um, as a service, but it's not compulsory and it's certainly something that is there as a service. But people might choose to do different organisational suitability um, elements in different ways um, and it might be more appropriate to to look at um, individuals in a different way and, and we're really only asking in the personnel security um, requirement to say who are your critical workers um, those who can critically impact the functioning of, of infrastructure and how do we mitigate um, any any organizational suitability requirement um, so that your infrastructure asset from a personnel security perspective can can operate securely and, and people were thinking about uh, people who have super user access um, access to a control room those who can fundamentally impact the functioning of an infrastructure facility okay thanks um, and a, a question in relation to systems of national significance has come in um, how does the department home affairs or the center def determine which systems are nationally significant uh, and they've asked for some considerations in relation to those in the social economic um, stability areas of Australia national security defence. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question and the, the criteria for um, defining a system of national significance is really looking at those three elements, the consequences that would arise for the social or economic prosperity or stability of Australia, our national security or our defence. So when, when you think about that, um, that, that's kind of the biggest element. What are the, the infrastructure assets which, which fundamentally go to the prosperity of society or our security broadly defined? So that's, that's the first element. And the second element is really around the interdependency with other infrastructure. So if you look at those two in parallel, you immediately come up with what are the enablers to infrastructure? What are the enablers to life? And how do, how do you start to define the biggest areas of um, aggregate um, provision of service and so so that's the starting point within that though we then work down and say well what are the most important infrastructure assets for those particular functions in Australia and and how do we start to look at the systems which increasingly are um, prevalent across lots of society and lots of um, parts of how we we operate as a country and, and you naturally get to major inputs and major utilities major ways to communicate um, and, and to really think about what are all the inputs to making us function. So that's that's our concept. And then within that each individual sector, we have a really um, good understanding of what are the major things that make the sector function and what are the major inputs and, and how, do, how um, do we look at the, the major, most important parts. Thanks for that. Um, and Jess is asking a question in relation to part 2A of the Act um, mm -hmm. that requires responsible entities to have and follow a uh, risk management program, but saying only the draft rules have been released at this point. Um, and have we got an indication when the Minister may uh, finalise the rules and, and publish them um, to uh, so that they're provided to what is critical data processing provider? Yeah, sure. So um, the, the Minister has asked um, us to consult on her behalf between 5 October and 18 November. So the, the draft rules are out there for consultation and for consideration. Um, and then um, the Minister will look at all of the submissions and must um, consider the public interest criteria, which really go to proportionality, cost, um, whether or not there's another regulatory system of the Commonwealth or state and territory that could undertake the same function. And then, then come to the view about, yes, I'm going to make the risk management program rule in the, the original format that I consulted on, or I'm going to make changes and, and, and put a revised rule in place, or indeed may, may decide to make no rule at all. Um, and, and so that, that's the process that will happen in um, late November into early December. I, I anticipate earliest um, that we will see a final risk management program rule is 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 early December. And then when, when you think about the implementation of the rule, uh, we've got in there 
um, companies have six months to implement the risk management program. So you start to think about risk management developing programs over that January to June period of 23, and then probably the first reporting period for boards to really engage in the annual reporting under part 2A is, is really around 1st of July through to 28 September. Um, so those 90 days after the first of the Australian financial year, I often get, get asked which financial year it is, but it, it is the Australian financial year. Thanks, Hamish. And Gabrielle has given a bit of a um, follow up question and, and uh, her question, I think, specifically relates to telcos and ensuring that um, uh, organisations, and I think this applies to any organisation, um, is more proactive, not rather than avoiding or even just being reactive after the event. And I think really that's the heart of what we're talking about today and, and the work that your centre has been doing. That, that's exactly right. All, all of those positive, um, well, two of our positive obligations really go to understanding the, the risk and understanding where things are. Um, trying to put in place a risk management approach and a response in a preventative sense. And then in a responsive sense, um, getting a sense about the prevalence of cyber incidents occurring and then being able to respond to them. So so our, our big focus is on, on prevention and, and making sure that, that events don't occur where, where that's possible to mitigate or eliminate those risks. And, and something where I think that risk management is at the heart of every security decision. So, so we're, we're really up for prevention and, and we really hope that um, in doing so, we're, we're starting to model for the rest of the world um, what what a baseline cybersecurity standard is, and what a baseline risk management standard is for infrastructure, and we hope others will start to follow and emulate that approach. And a bit of a follow up question, I think um, this one goes to and. Uh, I know there's a lot of reputational risk associated with um, any breach that becomes public knowledge. The question though is um, saying there still seems to be a level of secrecy around breaches that occur even within organisations um, and that there's a level of perception of blame and cultural issues. I know we're going to be touching on those sorts of things in future webinars as well. Um, but the question is, do you feel secrecy around breaches is required or acceptable? Um, because that may also have an impact on people reporting or organisations and entities reporting incidents. Well, um, critical infrastructure are now mandatorily obliged to report um, at law, and um, that, that's really designed to understand the true nature of the, the cyber incidents that are successfully occurring against infrastructure. And, and the best reason to report early and to share the, the problem is a problem shared is a problem, well, not half, but a problem shared is is actually a better way to find a solution. And so if you, you share um, the, the fact of a cyber incident occurring, the best advice from the Australian Cyber Security Centre is, is available and the best advice and support from the government more generally is there. Um, and th there, is, there is though um, a requirement, I think increasingly from consumers and from those who who use services is for data to be secure and protected. And there is a major reputational damage um, that, that does occur for those companies that have suffered a, a breach, but, but which can always um, be ameliorated in some ways by um, proactive engagement, providing advice about what to do and, and support after the event. But the best way to, to try and prevent a cyber event from happening or from a particular hazard from happening is to be secure in the first place and to do everything you can on risk management. And so I think um, just to circle back to prevention is the, the, the best pill taken every day. Thanks Hamish. And I think that's a great way to wrap up uh, the webinar today. First of all, very much like to thank you. We've ranged across a broad um, range of topics and uh, you've been really um, helpful and providing a lot of it detailed information. Thank you very much to all our attendees and all of your questions. Apologies, we couldn't get to every one of them, but we've tried to cover as many as we could and see some of those key themes that emerged. Uh, we've talked about the centre's website and we've also posted some links um, in the question and answer chat section so that you can go and get some further specific details details, um, connect with the centre, etc. So look, it's really clear um, that this series of webinars is going to be highly important for organisations, uh, critical infrastructure entities, owners, operators, our um, CISOs and um, chief risk officers across Australia. So really looking forward to continuing the partnership with the Department of Home Affairs and the, and the Infrastructure Centre itself. 
Um, it's just clear we need a, you know, good leadership. We need to focus on those key risks uh, and be um, not just focused simply on compliance. Compliance is important, but having that resilient and resilient approach to managing an integrated risk framework for our organisations. Um, so look, I'd really again like to thank Hamish very much for this. Uh, Thanks again to everybody for participating. Our next webinar is on the 15th of November and it's a panel discussion that's specifically focusing on cyber security. So we'll have um, a, a great range of experts coming and talking about their experiences and offering advice in relation to strengthening cyber security. So thanks very much. Hope you can join us for the next one and thank you very much for participating today. Thanks, Hamish. Thanks, Leanne.